Happy Easter, everyone. So today's reading is about Easter. It's also titled, Resurrection for Every Soul. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, we read the inspiring account of Jesus' resurrection. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. The resurrection of Jesus, doubted by many, but affirmed by those who were close to him, was a miraculous event, though one not unique in history. For many great saints of other religions have appeared to their disciples after death. Sometimes their appearances have been as that of Jesus was, in flesh and blood form, and not only in vision. Paramahansa Yogananda relates in Autobiography of a Yogi the account of his guru Sri Yukteswar's resurrection after his earthly passing. Miracles of this type are revealed only rarely to the masses, but accounts of them, related by men and women of reputed truthfulness, have inspired many devotees with faith in the reality of subtler than material states of existence. Resurrection, Yogananda explained, means transformation, ultimately from any lower state of being to a higher one. Worldly consciousness cannot imagine such transformation, except in terms of, perhaps, an improvement of the present mess of pottage, with the addition of a new flavoring. Divine consciousness, however, is capable of taking the base metal of worldliness and transforming it into the spiritual gold of divine wisdom and love. In keeping with this truth, the Bhagavad Gita in the ninth chapter tells us, Ah, ye who into this ill world are come, fleeting and false, set your faith fast on me, fixed heart and thought on me, adore me, bring offerings to me, make me prostrations, make me your supremest joy, and, undivided, unto my rest, your spirits shall be guided. Thus through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. The first topic that I want to take up here when we talk about Easter is uh, this where it says that uh, the resurrection of Jesus doubted by many. It's very hard to know the highest truths, that if we wanted to know the truth, did Jesus really resurrect himself? Most people would probably think, well, Google tells us lots of th true things, let's Google this. And you might look on there and you'll find every range of opinion from the fact that he didn't even exist to the fact that certainly he died and he came back to life. And you'll find even many more things and you just won't know what to believe. So when it comes to something that's number one, so far away, and number two, so beyond our normal everyday experiences, what we have to do is take the opinion of people that we trust, that we either have to look closer in time and find saints that we believe are true saints. One example that comes to mind is um, St. Francis of Assisi, that he's a little closer to us in time anyways. And it, he said that he saw Christ often, that often Christ would materialize into a flesh and blood form and converse and tell St. Francis what to do. If we look at the rest of St. Francis's life, didn't look like he'd be one to make things up or lie in any particular way. And so it's safe to say that we could trust him that Jesus Christ could do this. Now, um, another point that I was bringing up here was that <clears throat> this happened 2,000 years ago. And the reason that it's really relevant to us <clears throat> is that it gives us faith that there's so much more to our own potential. But I'm going to go into that more in a minute. I want to get back to, did this really happen? If so, have there been other people who have done this? And in the Western world, pretty much I think Christ is the only one credited with this uh, miracle of uh, stupendous proportions. Um, but in India, well, 
lots of fun things happen in India all the time. And I'm pretty sure that Kabir pulled off this little miracle. I believe that the story goes that uh, when he died, the Muslims and the Hindus were fighting over his body. So uh, he rematerialized and or animated that body again. I don't know the exact details. He said, please, my children, stop fighting. And he said, I'll now turn my body into flowers. You can bury half of it according to the uh, Muslim tradition, and I don't remember what was done with the Hindu tradition, whatever rites and ceremonies needed to be done. And then he turned his body into flowers, and each half was taken away, and appropriate things were done. <clears throat> also, the Hindu Mahashaya did the same thing. You can read about in Autobiography of Yogi. Sri Yukteswar did the same thing. Um, and this gets us to the point of the matter. It's said that Babaji is still retained his form today. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about immortality, and we will talk about that a little bit later. But, so the point first though is that this isn't often done in an outward way. Even these stories of the Hiri Mahashaya or Sri Yukteswarji, that he showed himself to a few disciples, and it's those disciples' job to tell other people. And normally those disciples are credible, you know, high upstanding people who don't lie, and then Mankind gets to make the choice whether they want to see it or not. If God just came down and bombarded us with miracles, you know, from morning until dusk, that we wouldn't use our own free will to try to evolve and try to advance spiritually. We would just continually be touching the feet of these highly evolved ones and asking them to do the work for us. And it just doesn't work like that, that we have to evolve. We're continually evolving over many, many lifetimes, and we keep doing it until we reach the state that these great masters have reached. So they come to show us what is our true potential, and our true potential is that we are immortal. And we do need to think about this. In the beginning that sounds like such a crazy thing, because you look around and you just don't, it not just sounds like an outright lie. You just see everybody, one by one, conking off and going back into some world where we have no idea where it is and their bodies are cold and lifeless and we just don't know what happens on the other side. But as you begin to explore the spiritual path, you begin to see that there are people who do remember what happens on the other side. If you begin to meditate deeply, perhaps you may get to have glimpses into the astral world or perhaps you will start to remember some of your past lives. And you begin slowly to realize that this physical body is not the only one that we take. You know, life is the continual evolution of consciousness. And those words, continual evolution of consciousness, I don't mean that we're evolving to sharpen our stick better, to make a better spear so that we can eat the other animals before they eat us. That's like the lowest level of evolution we can think of, but there's, you know, the tigers, they're trying to do that step. We're trying to get much higher than that, and we're trying to evolve back to who we truly are. We're trying to evolve from the consciousness of an animal. First, an animal turns into a super animal. I said this last week, which means turns into a god. But then that, uh, I'm sorry, a super animal turns into a man. But then we want to become supermen, which means that we evolve into gods. And so we have to keep learning how to refine our consciousness. We have to keep asking the questions, how does this thing called life work? How do we make this thing called life better? How do we get happier? How do we gain more spiritual power? How do we gain more joy? And as we ask those questions, we will evolve, but ultimately then we begin to realize, okay, we come back to this game called life again and again and again on the physical plane until we learn how to fully transcend it. And learning to fully transcend it really means embracing the fact that we are immortal. But now we just want to go beyond the fact that immortality means that we're on this cycle that seems to be never ending. It means that we too have the ability to evolve to become Jesus Christ, who can resurrect, even if our body's dead, that we can resurrect it. You see, Christ said, uh, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Those three days symbolized that each one of us is a three-part being, that we have a physical body, we have an astral body, which is made of energy, and we have our causal body, which is made of thoughts. And if we want to pull off one of these grand stunts, 
like being able to bring ourselves back from the dead, we have to have supreme control over all three of our bodies. That our mind needs to be so strong that we know that we can do that. And then with a strong mind like that, we govern our energy in order to do this, and then we can affect things on a physical plane. Now, don't run up and say, okay, I got it, let's try it out. We have to try these things in small ways. First we have to see, do you have a little cold? Can you heal that with affirmations, with mental power, with control over your energy? And if you can do that, then can you heal little other problems? Can you heal other people? Can you heal other people without them even knowing that you're doing it? Simply through the strength of your magnetism and your energy. Because ultimately it's not yours anyways, it's God's, but you become a channel for it. And once you begin to operate on that level, then slowly, slowly you start climbing up. But even then, the purpose of all of this isn't to be able to impress your next door neighbor with miracles. With You've studied now the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda and you can do strange and wonderful things. The purpose of learning to control our energy, the purpose of learning to control our mind, is to go deeper and deeper into a state of love with God, is to go deeper and deeper into a state of God's joy. And that's what we really want to share. And so, don't get obsessed with miracles, because as you progress spiritually, you will learn certain things. But, you know, this is an interesting point. That when you look at, oh, they used to map this curve of an IQ test in America, that they would have people take the test, and it's your intelligence quotient, and then they would, you know, make this curve, and as you get up to the people who are very smart, you get uh, fewer and fewer people who are very, very smart. But now when you start going off into the, a spiritual curve like that, where we're talking about evolution over thousands of lifetimes, maybe millions of lifetimes, that some people's spiritual advancement goes way off the charts, and there's not many people anywhere near that are of that same level. And even then, there might be somebody even way more advanced than them, and the saints are really playing a hiding game down here because they're even in the midst of all of this trying to get rid of their ego and the thought that they're, they're doing any of this. Um, so you'll never really know actually who a saint is by outward signs. That you'll know it by attunement with them and by a deep feeling of how much you feel God radiating from them. And so the point of this was that as you begin to grow don't let your ego grow, and try to be that silent saint who's uplifting things in obscurity, even as God is hidden, that you want your spiritual greatness also to stay hidden, unless God commands you, as he did for Christ, to do these wonderful outward things. But the people who get those commandments are beyond falling from a state of ego. Um, now, let's get into immortality, and let's get into the fact that Christ and these great ones come not to show us how great they are, but for us to remember how great we are. And you've heard those words maybe many, many times if you've been on the spiritual path for a while. But let's, let's really get into this business of immortality. And let's really try to grasp, can we really do it? Are we really immortal? Can we really do what Babaji did? Uh, a little while ago I gave a class, and I just want to touch on that. I don't have time to go fully me into it, but I really wondered, how did Trilonga Swami live for 300 years? That you read an autobiography of a yogi, and it says he's reputed to have lived, but, and now I was just saying Google won't tell you the truth, but I Googled it, and it seemed that there's many accounts of uh, many different people uh, affirming and many different records uh, that prove that he really lived to be 300 years old. Okay. So that being valid, well, how did he do it? Can you live to be 300 years old? Can I live to be 300 years old? What are the steps? Where do we start? And so that was happening with, for those of you who are Kriya bonds, I got into a little phase of, I got a new phone. I was timing each Kriya with the phone. And those two things, plus a little read, reading of Autobiography of a Yogi, take us into a very interesting subject. If you read an Autobiography of a Yogi, or Swami Kriyananda also mentions it uh, in the Raja Yoga book, that one of the secrets to how yogis can live to be a very, uh, very old, live a very long time, is through mastering the breath. And that if you 
take that we're given a certain number of breaths, and you take that as a finite number, even though it's very large. I was doing a lot of math. I don't have time to go into the math tonight. But if we just estimate, let's say, that we're given 65 crore breaths in one incarnation. And then if you start doing the math, if you can really do your kriyas at 30 seconds each, and if you start doing hours uh, per day of 30 seconds per breath, you can start extending out how many breaths you get for many, many years. Another factor into it is when you bring your Kriya back into daily life, that your breath rate, just when you're sitting there calmly in the office, will be much lower how many breaths you take per minute than your co-worker over there who is jumping up and down at every right and wrong thing that happens in the universe and with a very restless breath. Um, now, I look deeply into that, but it was enough for me to realize I need to start to become aware of my breath. I've said this in a past uh, satsang here, but it's worth considering again. Of when I was with a, at a satsang of Swami Kriyanandaji, and someone asked, when should I be aware of the energy moving up and down my spine? And I was a newbie at that time, I was thinking, oh, I know, I know the answer. And I thought he would say, when you're practicing Kriya, you should be aware of the energy moving up and down your spine. But he said, oh, you should be aware of the breath move, or the energy moving up and down your spine at all times. Now, relate that back to what I was just saying of how do we live to first be 300 before we try to go Babaji style and live for uh, many millenniums. And so, we need to become conscious of our breath at all times. Are we huffing and puffing throughout the day, or are we taking smooth, slow breaths? And it's, it's easier in some level, because sometimes we have to do things that are very mentally uh, involved, but you can begin to, if you gain an awareness, your subconscious mind will change the things that it's uh, becoming aware of. And you gain an awareness of this energy moving up and down your spine at all times, and even little aberrations when it moves a little faster, um, or a little bit differently than it would, you begin to feel that's not quite right. And this is the beginning to learning how to achieve immortality. I'm going to bring up a few more interesting things. Um, there's four things in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, but you can take it for what you will, four things that we need to learn to control if we want to achieve immortality. One I was just talking about is our life force, that we have to be in control of our life force and we have to deeply understand energy we have to understand that we are beings of energy we're beings of light and it's not an easy thing to learn to control our energy in fact and if we want to gain more immortality i believe that we need to learn so much that we are beings of energy that we no longer need to eat anymore that we know that well yes i'm just made of energy and it's energy that sustains this body and so I no longer need to eat. And so these points that I'm giving, you know, all oh, you need to learn to control this, 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 it's not, it's not a one day process that slowly we learn to control these things, but it is fun to think about where is all this headed and where am I right now and how can I get there? And even if you're a great foodie, don't worry, because if you practice the energization exercises often, and if you practice Kriya Yoga, your desire for food will go like this. Your desire to uh, grab energy at its source will go like this. I used to love eating sweets, just every kind you could ever imagine. Well, one, yes, it tasted good, but number two, it would take my blood sugar up like this, it would take my energy at level up like this. But slowly, over many years, I've learned to go to the source, to grab energy from its source, which is from the entire cosmos, rather than spike the blood sugar something to consider. Um, okay, so we need to gain control of our energy. Uh, number two, we need to gain control of the breath. Breathlessness is deathlessness. That as you become an advanced Kriya Yoga, Kriya Yogi, and you practice this, you will begin to realize that you just simply do not need to breathe as much. That you have great control over the physical breath. Also fascinating point about Kriya Yoga, it's oxygen itself, as you take in more oxygen through Kriya Yoga, that oxygen, it transmutes back into energy. There's certain elements like oxygen and hydrogen 
that readily go back into the ether. I'm not going to get into it with the scientists tonight about whether the ether exists or not, but it's the barrier between the astral world and the physical world. And certain elements make that transition much easier than other elements. And so as we add that extra oxygen with Kriya, we are adding extra life or extra energy. And so all of these four things that I'm going to talk about this evening, they're all interconnected. Um, so we must gain control of our breath. We must become masters of it. We must learn how to stop breathing at will. And slowly, slowly, through years of meditation, we begin to understand that the peace that comes in between breaths as we practice Hong Sa is supremely enjoyable. And that peace and those, that length in between the breath becomes longer and longer, and our joy levels just go more and more up. Um, there's other ways to learn to control the breath, but if you do all of the techniques that we've given, you have more than enough. And just keep practicing those, and you will gain mastery over breath will gain mastery over energy. The third that we have to learn to control, not much talked about, but should be a little bit, and that is our sexual fluid. That if we're just giving this away uh, every day or something like that, every week even, that we will age prematurely. It's very clearly stated uh, in Genesis, that might not be true, but yes it is, in Adam and Eve, uh, where do not eat of the apple of the tree of life, or ye shall die. And if you observe people who indulge frequently in this activity, they age prematurely. However, I believe the converse is true, that if you can learn to control that perfectly, that you can uh, achieve immortality. Now, is this the only thing for immortality? That the other things that I've talked about are also there. And don't go around looking at people and he looks old and now you think you know everything about him. He might be perfectly celibate. Swamiji told me of a man that he met uh, in Puri. I think it was in Puri. It may not have been. And the man was a brahmacharya, I think, or some kind of sannyasi. And he told Swamiji that he'd been perfectly celibate for 20 years. And Swamiji looked into his eyes and he said, and I believed him. But when I looked into his eyes, he was a dope. And so much he didn't say anything else, but I took that to mean that the man was doing drugs, that he wasn't highly advanced spiritually. I imagine that he also was showing all the ages or signs of aging. The point of that story is, number one, don't go around judging people. That's not your job. Your job is to love people. Uh, number two, that your job is to transform yourself. And then number three, don't think you've got one little secret and now you know everything. That is the real secret of life, of immortality, is how to put all of these secrets together. And celibacy won't be achieved if you do not have control of the breath, if you do not have control of life force, and the fourth point we're going to talk about, if you do not have control of your mind. Now, I want to get back one more point I want to make. Yes, you could try to develop any one of these four, uh, like really just focus on it, like just go crazy on the pranayam and say, I'm going to become immortal, I'm going to do a zillion kriyas a day, or whatever the case may be. But if you're not controlled on all those other levels, you'll probably go crazy, or something will not go right. You might with pranayama develop a huge set of lungs, but maybe you have a little tiny brain, and you have to develop your mind too. So again, try to understand, try to learn how all four of these aspects, they all go together. And now the fourth, mind. Um, let's take the words of Paramahansa Yogananda. On a little piece of thought rests the cosmic lot. So if you think that you're going, okay, breathlessness, deathlessness, I'm just going to sit here, and I'll get my mind strong enough and I just won't breathe anymore. Well, you can try that and it won't work. That your mind has to become very, very strong. And we build our mind slowly by slowly doing a little bit of tapasya. And then the mind wants to take, you know, a dive downward and just go, oh, this is no good. What else takes a dive downward? Our breath, our breathing will change. Our energy will go downward. So. When our mind's going down like that, we have to learn how to bring it up, even in difficult circumstances. God never gives us more than we can handle. God gives us small circumstances right now at this phase of our spiritual evolution so that we can learn how to have an 
even mind during these little small daily tests of life and then slowly he'll give us greater challenges one day maybe crucifixion and yet we'll know well I'm the infinite soul in this body it's going to be subject to pain it's going to be subject to pleasure it's all right and ultimately we will learn even in times of great distress or strife to send love to everyone even our enemies because it ultimately is just God acting in ignorance in that form for a little while and that we still that person is a soul and we want to send love to that soul it means that we can say yes your actions are wrong and I do not support your actions but I support you separate the person from the wrong actions everybody makes mistakes you know let me end here we're getting near the end so mind so we have to develop that mental power you'll develop it most in meditation when you can keep your mind on one thing at a time and not let your mind wander so do keep your mind on God I hope in meditation and see if you can get that strength and as you learn to withdraw your energy and you learn to bring your energy up to the spiritual eye that you have to have that perfect faith and you have to love God alone and even in that things will try to draw your mind outside desires uh, habits will try to draw your mind outside of yourself and take your mind away from perfect love of God but just keep bringing it back just keep bringing it back and one day we will get there now Christ he came he did he went through all this suffering you know he didn't really suffer he was beyond suffering if he had suffering at all it was for us for not understanding who he was but he went through all of this to show us that ultimately the lamb triumphs over the wolf and we look out in this world and it looks like everybody's just wolves everybody's just seeing how much they can take from me and how they can take advantage of me and do all these bad things to me and well you know, it's true <laughs> we don't live in the highest age people usually have a lot of big egos and are just thinking about themselves and not and that ego sets it up in their minds that it doesn't matter what happens to him he's separate from me even if I hurt him it's good for me so it's good and that's the delusion most people are under but don't get swept up into that don't get caught into worldliness Christ didn't get caught in that even under the worst circumstances but he showed us that love ultimately overcomes all. That love actually overcomes death. It is the power of love that brings us all back together again and again. It's the power of love that will take you to your relatives on the other side when you cross over. You have no idea where they are right now in the astral world. However, your soul will find them through that attractive power of love. Again, however, read in the Bhagavad Gita, those who come to their relatives at the time of, or those who think of their relatives at the time of death, go to their relatives. Those who think of the lower gods, go to the lower gods. Those who think of me, come to me. And that me, it's not Krishna the man, a blue man. It's Krishna the Christ consciousness, or the Krishna consciousness. Those who at the time of death can go into that state, become one with God. And I'll give you one more secret here that at the time of death, you know, Paramahansa Yogananda told Swamiji, God won't come to you until the end of your life. I believe that was a veiled understanding for those who know, for those who have ears to hear. That in Sabi Kalpa Samadhi, it's as if you're dead, that you're no longer breathing, your heart no longer needs to beat, but you're very much aware. And so that test of death is a test for every single one of us to see do we love God. But it's not death like we think of death. There is no death. It's do we love God more than all of our outer attachments? And if we do, we can withdraw our life force in so deeply, and we can love God so deeply that we can cross beyond all those portals and barriers that are normally kept hidden, and then we can come back. This is a good thing. If any other human being did it, you can do it too. If you don't have personal experience of these higher things, Look to those who have experience a little bit higher than yours. And find out from them. Learn from them. Slowly climb the upward ladder. Climb the living tree. It is within your own self. It is your own inner astral spine. Climb that living tree one step at a time so that you too 
may resurrect your own self, that you can resurrect yourself from your fears, from your doubts, from any pain and suffering, and you can arise again to become the child of God that you truly are. It's been a wonderful evening, and I look forward to the next time. Have a great week.